there's a lot of fear about how this change is going to shift the paradigm in education for both students and teachers. Students are fearful that like what is relevant for them to know and to learn, not just in school, but especially as they, you know, encounter the job market, what skills are in demand for them? It's scary, right? You know, the integration of AI and possibility of AGI makes us reconsider our role as humans in the universe. And that's a really, really, you know, profound thing to consider. And I think it's important to shift the conversation to one of how can we talk about it? How can we create spaces so that we can both manage and mitigate the fear as well as embrace the technology in a way that is going to enrich the learning experience? Welcome to our second episode of Implementable AI in Education. I'm here with my co-host, Evan. Um, and Evan, why don't you introduce our second guest? Yeah, so um, we're here with Nicholas. Um, and Nicholas is a first-year student at Yale. Uh, he spoke uh, at a roundtable, was hosted by the Department of Education. He's done an AI advisory board. Uh, he's the current VP of uh, Vidutam. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Please correct me in a second if I did. And about 10 other things that make me feel bad as a 35-year-old uh, for not having accomplished more uh, by the time I was his age. Um, you know, I was, I was telling Aaron before we started that a lot of people in our space talk about centering students. But when it comes to, hey, who are you inviting to your panel? Who are you interviewing? Like, who are you actually centering um, in the content that you're making? Like, is that voice heard? Too often, it's, it's kind of missing. So I'm really excited to have an actual bona fide student with us who's in class every day thinking about this stuff from your perspective. So welcome, Nicholas. Thank you so much for the introduction, Evan, and for inviting me as well, Aaron. Really excited to be here and to talk about AI and education, edtech, fintech, all these uh, interesting spaces, and most importantly, how we can center youth voices and ensure that they not only have a seat at the table, but their voices are actually heard in part of the policy and implementation process of all these really transformative technologies. Cool. Well, so um, maybe to kind of bridge off of that, that introduction, <laughs> um, one of the things both Aaron and I were kind of curious about was given how long your CV is for someone your age, I mean, you have already done a ton. I'm really curious about kind of who those people have been, um, family members, teachers uh, in Los Angeles where you're from, uh, public figures, like who who kind of has been like the fuel in your fire and the inspiration, like who has supported you and kind of gotten you to where you are and uh, already at this early stage? Yeah. So thank you so much for that question. I think it's important to go back to the beginning of my journey and how that unfolded. Um, so in elementary school, I was not really engaged at all with learning. It wasn't something that really piqued my interest. And um, part of that reason, as we as we later found out, was because I encountered a lot of uh, learning difficulties. Um, so in fifth grade, I was diagnosed with ADHD and anxiety. And that, you know, really um, sort of validated the issues I was having with reading and other sort of classes as well in elementary school. Um, and that sort of lack of interest in learning, not really being super engaged relative to some of my peers, um, continued, um, you know, towards the end of elementary school and, and in middle school. And it wasn't until sort of the end of middle school, beginning of high school, that I found my love for learning. And what really kickstarted that was by reading uh, biographies and books about things that actually interest me, right? And in, in elementary school and middle school, is all all the content that I was digesting was was sort of put on me by you know my teachers and sort of assigned. Um, but when I started sort of taking agency over my experience and, and, and opening up my views about the world, that's when my learning interests um, sort of became something that was part of how I navigated school, part of who I was. Um, so I read a lot of great books about, um, about you know, business and technology and, you know, in, in a couple of years later about AI. And uh, that really set the foundation for realizing that I, you know, could be um, you know, could have an impact in the space of technology. And um, through that, I, I decided to dedicate myself a lot to, to my studies. And my biggest layers of support were my teachers at school. I had amazing teachers in all sorts of different disciplines. My English teacher, my stats teacher, my physics teacher, so many incredible teachers who cared about not just my learning experience, but actually about who I was. They took interest in who I was as a person 
connected with me, checked in with how, with how I was doing, especially during COVID. And that was transformational in, in creating a sense of community, not just with my peers, but my teachers. And that, you know, is, is that I did sense of community and identity is still with me today. It's a core part of how I navigate the whole learning experience. It's, it's by connecting with others. It's by learning through others' experiences and, and feeling um, engaged with the material I'm learning. I mean, that this resonates with me on so many levels. I've got a seven-year-old son who is ADHD to the ADHD, ADHD. <laughs> um, and, and he's brilliant and his mind is beautiful, but he struggles in that kind of classic space. And I definitely um, have ADHD as well. And so, you know, to see someone else who's probably leveraged that, like you as a superpower later in life is really, really powerful. And then, as you know, I'm obsessed with capstone senior projects and, and connecting who we are, the ups and downs of our lives and what we love to our learning. And, and I wanted to ask you, like, to talk about your senior project at Campbell Hall and how that led you into the trajectory and what you're working on right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, before going to the senior project, you brought up an amazing point, which is that these learning differences can be leveraged as a superpower an advantage that students can 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 learn and um my sort of superpower with adhd and you know not just me but other people have adhd and anxiety is is the sort of creativity facet um and always wanting to dive into as many interesting things as possible trying to learn about how things work stuff of that nature um so what led me to my senior project was an interest in ai that uh, started to unfold in around uh, ninth or tenth grade I watched a really insightful documentary about AI, and then soon after, I bought a book that I actually still have right here. It's called uh, Life 3.0 uh, by Max Tegmark, who now leads the Future of Life Institute. Um, and I once I learned about AI and and you know understood its um, huge influence on society that it was already beginning to have, but also the future potential. I really engaged, learned the technical side of AI. Um, but then around senior year, when I was, you know, faced with the senior project and for context that my school is optional. So my, my high school is about a hundred, uh, almost 130 students and about 15 to 20 of them did a senior project. Right. And, and a big, you know, cause of that, which we we're all aware of is this, this notorious, um, burnout or that, you know, seniors face, but I really wanted to explore AI and, and specifically learn about how AI was affecting the education space, especially as a neurodiverse learner who had struggled in the traditional classroom environment. I wanted to see how are these technologies being leveraged by you know communities and students in order to enhance learning. And when I dove into that for my senior project in, in May and June uh, of 2023, I realized that this was still such a nascent space because ChatGPT had only come out um, around uh, five or six months ago at that point. And there wasn't really any consensus and clear policy from school leaders in higher ed or K through 12. So I you know, took it upon myself to uh, put together a policy recommendation for my senior project um, for my high school, which they ended up adopting as a foundation for their policy um, and also wrote an op-ed about AI and education and its potential to en enrich the learning experience for neurodiverse students. And that sort of led me to realizing, okay, this wasn't just a senior project for me. This is something I, I was really passionate about and I want to continue. So I ended up engaging with other youth leaders in the space, got involved in an organization called Encode Justice. And that's really sort of been the, the front door to many of the opportunities I'm now um, working with and engaging with. So it's, I think it's important to emphasize for students that senior project isn't just a project that you know they, they should do because it's you know beneficial for them. It's something that can open up the door to their interests and their career paths that they may have never even explored otherwise. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, Nicholas, I'm really interested in what was in that policy, first of all, and congratulations for getting it adopted. That's so cool. Um, but it reminds me of, of something I was watching earlier today and Aaron, I, I'd love to get your reaction to this as well. Um, so, uh, a little bit in grad school, I studied like organizational development and systems change. Um, but our last guest, uh, said something that kind of stuck in my ear. He said like the problem of AI integration in, in schools, at least from the leader's perspective, the leadership perspective is a problem about change management. So I started doing some research into change management and watched this TED talk earlier today. Um, this woman at uh, San Diego State University um, who said something really interesting, and I want to get your, your take on it. 
um, because I think it affects not only faculty, but maybe students as well. And she said, um, people are not resistant to change. They're resistant to loss and the losses they think that change will bring, right? So that might be um, the loss of your sense of expertise and your confidence. It might be the loss of your sense of stability and your routines. Um, there are all these different kinds of loss that people can kind of deal with. And she was saying that if you're leading an organization or a group of people through change, you have to create space for people to process that loss and to kind of talk about it openly and to do a bit of truth telling um, before you can get people maybe excited and bought into a vision for the future and all the opportunities that brings. But I'm, I'm curious how that resonates with both of you. Aaron, maybe we'll start with you. Does, does that track with you? Like, how does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's this, this fear that my expertise is gone, that with, with an emerging technology, you know, what I held dear, the power I had is now challenged. And we've all had really good teachers in our lives, but we've also had not great teachers that love that power. And that love, you know, kind of being the sole source of knowledge and the challenge of that, right? I think for some of them, um, either has to be reframed that you still are, you're a source of knowledge, you're a source of capacity building in students, that you're a source of mindset creation, that you're a source of kind of depth as you go into subjects, whether you're subject matter expertise. <clears throat> but if that can be paired with now the world is your oyster. Right. Like in leading capstone programs or senior programs, a really great teacher has to know that they don't have to be an expert on the th on the project that a student is working on. They just need to be the conduit. They need to be a coach. They need to be a networker. And I think like that's where you have to reframe the role of a teacher in 2023 or 2032. Nick, yeah. how about you? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a that's a really insightful TED talk, you know, as as it relates to, to what we're facing in AI and education today. Um, there's a lot of fear about how this change is going to shift the paradigm in education for both students and teachers. I'll focus on the student side as a student. <clears throat> I think it's yeah. really disheartening for, for students to now, um, who are, you know, just in middle school or high school and learning how to write essays and do all these, you know, um, critical thinking involving, in, involving tasks. And for them to be able to see that AI, that you know, an AI like ChatGPT is able to produce a 500 to 1,000 word essay that is not perfect, but is really good. And it's able to do that in two seconds when it would take them hours. And I think it raises a question, why should I learn how to write an essay? What is the value of this, right? If AI is able to do this, right? So students are fearful that like, what is relevant for them to know and to learn not just in school, but especially as they, you know, encounter the job market, what skills are in demand for them. And I think it's important to shift the conversation to one of, to one of fear to, and, and instead focus on how, like you said, how can we talk about it? How can we create spaces so that we can both manage and mitigate the fear as well as embrace the technology in a way that is going to enrich the learning experience. So for students, right, who are worried about, you know, the value of writing an essay, it's important to note that, you know, writing is is not just a way to get ideas on paper, but it's also a way to develop your own ideas, to really let that critical thinking flow in, in understanding the world. And I think that's really important to sort of reframe the conversation and show students that these are still really important skills that they're going to be able to learn. And the future in terms of the job market won't be just AI or just students or, you know, or people. It will be people plus AIs. People will be doing data analysis, will be writing reports in conjunction with AI. And AI will be a tool for them rather than this monolithic force that will replace them. So I think having clarity about how AI is going to enter the people's lives and affect the future is, is important. And having spaces where people can talk about that even before the adoption of AI is, I think, the, the first step in this work. So this is your freshman year. You're 19? Yes, 19. Um, and you're bombarded with classes already. Um, and, you know, you're in the, the thick of probably a, a pretty rigorous experience. Kind of give us the lay of the land of what you're working on. You know, we have lots of questions for you, but like for the people listening and for us, give us context on all the diff different buckets that you're kind of in. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I you know, I, I sort of think about it in, in two um, different prongs of, of my work and what I, you know, 
spend time thinking about academically and professionally, right? Um, so academically, I have, you know, I'm a full-time student, I have classes, um, I'm a cognitive science major, so really focusing on the intersection of computer science, psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, econ, as well as other dif- disciplines like anthropology, sociology, education. Um, so I have my classes there which at Yale, which I'm really dedicated to and spend a lot of time. Um, and interestingly, you know, the, what I've what I've derived most from these courses have been, um, you know, the interactions with with professors about this content outside the scope of the class, right? So I, I, I like asking my my teachers or my professors, how do you think AI sort of changes this landscape um, in which students are learning? Uh, it's really interesting, you know, as I as I do the work on the professional side to hear how their reactions because it's not, you know, it's not. Everyone has the same reaction. Some are embracing it. Some are fearful. Some are in the middle. Um, and so these conversations really inform my work on the professional side. And on the on the professional side, I um, I, I work at an organization that I mentioned before called Co Justice. I joined in May as an AI and education advisor. So developed a more comprehensive report of AI and education. And then. Um, you know, as AI and education advisor, we thought it would be in the founder Sneha Ravenor thought it would be a great idea to to create a council of people who are focused on AI's domain specific applications. So now I, I lead, love it. So yeah, now I lead a council of over um, I think it's now twenty two advisors, um, ranging from high school students to postgraduates. Um, so that's really exciting. We've produced reports um, that we've sent to our congressional partners, such as Senator Schumer's office, Senator Rounds, Heinrich, and Young, who are leading the Safe Innovation Framework. So AI's implications in not just education, but criminal justice, climate, sustainability, democracy, national security, and more. Um, I also work in an organization um, called FIDUTOM, um, and it's a it's a um, civil society group mobilizing 1,500 students towards building and, and regulating responsible technology. So um, we have a fintech application that we've developed that su- has supported over 1,100 um, underserved and unbanked individuals and provided them with microloans generating 400k in profits for their communities. And we also ran a study with 2,400 participants in, uh, from underserved communities in America and Sub-Saharan Africa um, that were, you know, that, that helped them on, you know, in Africa that helped them prepare for the national exams in the U.S., helped them learn about climate change and natural health. So we developed that EdTech app um, and it served as sort of like a study or a case, yeah, a case study for for deploying this. Um, so I am do you know really interested in the ed tech and fintech space, um, specifically AI policy, and uh, with education as as Evan mentioned, I spoke at the Department of Education at Google um, as well, and I was recently at the Senate um, a couple weeks ago, um, and then now at Yale, I'm serving as the first uh, student AI ambassador, so working closely with the administration on developing resources for AI and education, AI literacy, AI ethics. Also um, exploring and building ed tech applications to integrate into Yale's um, IT ecosystem, you know, to help students engage deeper with courses. Um, and also speaking with faculty and administrators about how AI um, is sort of influencing the, lo- the larger Yale ecosystem and how we can, you know, be pro- have a proactive approach in, in, in handling it to benefit student learning and engagement uh, across the university. So those are some of the things that I'm currently diving into, focusing just, on. Just a few things. Just yeah, a few yeah, things. Yeah, come on, get with it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, really excited about all, you know, moving forward, all those initiatives and especially in the new year. Um, and and, and I, I think this is going to be a huge year for EdTech. And I, I think the sort of personalized learning that we've been talking about for so long and, you know, enabling student engagement and agency will sort of come to fruition. Yeah. So so to that point, um, you know, I'm thinking about um, the move toward authentic assessment that a lot of schools are going to have to make in response to to AI. Right. The, the conversation about authentic assessment and the conversation about AI are intrinsically linked. Right. So when we're thinking about authentic assessment, uh, obviously we're thinking about learning more as a process than as an event. And I think we're also thinking about solving real world problems and sort of having an an outward looking view toward the rest of the world. Um, That's going to involve giving students a lot of resources and a lot of sort of capacity. So uh, access to good data, access to subject area experts, access to 
these AI tools, access to the knowledge to use them responsibly. But I'm curious, Nicholas, like if you were speaking to a high school junior and they said, my school wants us to start doing this thing called project-based learning and they want me to solve a problem or pursue my passion, but I don't know what problem to solve and I don't really know what I'm passionate about. What am I supposed to do? Clearly, you found really interesting problems and have tapped into some passions. So how would you advise a student who's sort of dealing with a new type of learning and is kind of at the precipice of it, but maybe unsure of how to go forward, how to take that first step? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's a really great point you bring up. And so many students in high school and even in college don't know, you know, what path they want to pursue. Um, and I think the best the best advice I have for students who are in that situation is just to read and, you know, not just read, but also watch movies and, and, and try to, you know, about uh, movies as in, you know, educational, like, you know, documentaries, um, as well as non educational, right, whatever piques your interest and figure out, you know, what is really resonating to you, what is speaking with you. So when I, you know, read, read books, I really liked um, reading autobiographies of business leaders. Um, I read a great um, uh, autobiography by the um, by the CEO of Disney called uh, who's Bob 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 Iger, um, and uh, I really loved reading about his leadership style um, and how he sort of navigated all these complex situations at Disney, and it was really inspiring, you know, for for him to share all of that and um, considering his path right wasn't sort of aligned with becoming the CEO of a multi billion cor- dollar corporation, uh, and I think just reading and, and, and connecting with other people's stories is the best approach to go by um, because then you can sort of start to see yourself in these people's shoes, right? Of whoever inspires you, whether it's business leaders, people of medicine, um, other spaces as well. So read uh, as much as possible. And, you know, on the, on the faculty and administrator side, um, encourage students to, you know, explore these projects, but also give them sufficient guidance for going about this, right? So, you know, here are sort of guidelines that you you should approach um, this exploration process by, I think is really valuable. Sure. I'm so interested in kind of education technology and AI that's still rooted in humanity um, and learning that is communal, that is shared. And it's one of the reasons why I work at Unruler and I'm trying to have this kind of documentation and storytelling be a core part of learning. Um, it seems like you've had a long-standing interest in promoting ethical and human-centered technology. What do you see as the most urgent problems that need to be solved? And can you tell us a bit about the moral harms and societal costs of of leaving those problems unaddressed? Yeah, absolutely. I think promoting human-centered and ethical technology is is really at the forefront of not just my mind, but a lot of youth who are you know interacting with these technologies on a day-to-day basis. Um, things such as algorithmic bias that, you know, are not just, you know, emerging with AI, but have always sort of been involved in the algorithms that we interact with day to day are really concerning for youth. Um, when I hear of stories of, of friends and, and other people within my community who haven't, you know, been able to have their face recognized by facial recognition technology and have heard stories about Amazon's hiring algorithm uh, unfairly discriminating against women. Um, and all these stories that are that are just you know coming to light um, are are really impactful in 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 students and people just think considering their relationship with technology. What is I think it fundamentally raises the question: What is the purpose of our techno uh, of technology? What relationship do we want to have? Right. Totally. And especially with AI, we want to be able to you know use it in a way that's beneficial to us and not sort of something that replaces us. It's a tool at the end of the day, like all technology is. Um, and I think, you know, your question also brings up an interesting point of this sort of landscape of AI policy and what's really stalling this larger agenda that we're all trying to combat. And within the AI community, um, I see there's sort of two camps. There's the AI ethics community, which is pioneered by leaders in academia as well as non-academia, but you know some of the most prolific figures there are Joy Bulamwini and Tim McEbrew and other li- leaders who are focused on combating um, bias and discrimination, algorithmic bias as well. And the sort of other um, group within this community, uh, within, within this larger AI community is the AI long-term risk community. So people who are concerned with AI's potential to spell the end of humanity 
if it if it is not aligned with AI. I mean, if it is not aligned with human values, um, and it is not sort of integrated in our society in a way that's beneficial and in a way that you know it could be very risky. Um, and I think this is you know the the reason I bring it up is because it also sort of diffuses into the AI and education l- landscape as well. Because we have students who are worried about both the short term, you know, not short term, but current, you know, AI risks with bias as well as the long term. Um, and I think bringing together these two communities um, is really important, um, not just at the policy level, but at the school level. And it goes back to what Evan was saying before. We need to have a shared space at school and in other you know, parts of our communities where we can talk about these issues. And it's not something that we feel sort of not compelled to talk about because it's scary. Right. You know, the integration of AI and possibility of AGI makes us reconsider our role as humans in the universe. And that's a really, really, you know, profound thing to consider. Um, But I think in order to enable youth to navigate these challenges as much as possible, we have to create these spaces. You know, um, Nicholas, I noticed you use the term algorithmic bias uh, instead of just bias. And I wonder, like, I just saw this interview. I think it was Mustafa Suleiman from uh, formerly of DeepMind uh, who said this. He said, like, you know, when we talk about AI being biased, it's actually like a little bit problematic because you're kind of engendering a sort of like a selfhood or an autonomy that almost implicitly kind of allows us to not take responsibility for what it does. Right. Because ultimately bias is the result of like human systems, right? Uh, Data that we gave it, right? And we have to be kind of on the hook for how these uh, models behave and what they output. And I think it's really important that we continue to feel that sense of agency in guiding AI responsibly forward, whether that's like its environmental impact, uh, content moderation is a really dark side of AI, especially like uh, in developing nations, like in Kenya, for example. Um, But I think it's really important that students and schools feel like they are in the driver's seat uh, and can be agents of change um, and can actually have like a voice in how AI moves forward, whether that's like the lessons they're teaching, the organizations they get um, sort of affiliated with or support. Like there is, it can't just be that we're passive users of AI, right? Um, so I'm, I'm curious if, if uh, you use that term kind of advisedly, like uh, algorithmic bias. Yeah. I- I think that's a really excellent point you bring up in that these biases that we're seeing manifest throughout society are merely hold up a mirror to human biases that so many people, so many communities have experienced for many years now. And it it, it brings up the question of, you know, I talk about algorithmic bias, right? That feeds into, you know, ensuring that AI is human aligned, which is part of the long-termist agenda. Um, So I think it, it is, it is a great point you bring up and, you know, it, it makes me think how we can, how, how youth can be a more active part of this work in addressing algorithmic bias. And um, it, I think it goes back to teaching students about AI literacy and having that not just be, you know, something that students are um, expected to learn on their own, but have it integrated into a class or some, some sort of, you know, like we, we have all these talks on, you know, at school on, you know, on drugs and alcohol and, you know, all these different things. And although it's vast, you know, AI is vastly different than that. These are still sort of standardized talks that all students are being exposed to. How can we have a similar talk for AI where we allow students to have conversations about this rather than the extent of conversations about AI being, oh, did you use ChatGPT to write your essay or stuff like that, right? And that brings up another point of ensuring there's transparency in the, you know, AI landscape and AI and education. Um, But yeah, I think, I think it is a really uh, important point um, that you bring up. What tips do you have? I mean, you're working with Yale um, in this kind of beautiful advisory role while you're a student. I'm sure you're learning just as much as you're kind of sharing back. Um, In that work, you're getting some really awesome understandings of what AI looks like in a classroom or looks like at an institution. What advice, what tips, what kind of implementation ideas would you give to school leaders or individual teachers to um, really be at the forefront of AI, AI implementation in their schools? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's so many interesting, I could talk about this for an hour, I feel like, of interesting and excellent implementations of AI. Good, um, we'll bring you back for another podcast episode. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, 
I think one of one of the interesting um, strategies that I've heard that's you know I, I've heard being used for a couple of months now is the deployment of uh, Socratic based teaching and learning in the classroom. Um, so you know now when you know AI is being is is capable of writing essays and there's doubts about the authenticity of essays and you know we found that uh, AI detectors are are very you know false and discriminate against uh, ESL learners um, and things of that nature. It's important for us to sort of like, you know, Evan has been saying to reinvent these assessment strategies. So rather than just having an essay due for like the final project or whatever, what if it's an essay and an oral defense whereby the the student has the teacher, I mean, yeah, the, the teacher has a student explain um, their thought processes and thesis. And I think it's really clear when you, you deploy that strategy, like how much it is clear, you know, for the teacher to be able to determine how much the student was actually engaged with this. Um, other, other useful strategies are, I, I think, um, having the teacher be compelled to actively, um, work with AI independently, right? So try chat GPT, try these other tools and rather than be on the sort of reactive end, be on the active end of actually understanding how these, um, technologies work. Um, another, another great strategy that I personally deployed has been using AI to help me study. So um, I had an exam, midterm exam, and one of my studying methods was to input my entire cognitive science study guide into um, a bot I created um, using ChatGPT. And then I would ask ChatGPT and the, or the bot I created to ask me questions about the content that I was expected to know. So I was, you know, I sort of, I was answering the questions rather than me asking the questions which I think is really interesting. Um, you know, that's not to say there are, like, it's important to note that there are tons of flaws, right? And hallucinations and biases, um, which is part of the AI literacy piece. Um, but I, I think a, another um, useful strategy is is having um, a teacher bring in an essay written by a student versus, and one written by an AI, and then having them analyze that and critique that and figure out- Interesting where the gaps are in knowledge are there hallucinations does it make up a quote is this level of analysis just very surface level which is you know fairly common sometimes um and and from there rather than just telling students oh ai is you know not as able it's not as as proficient as critical thinking as you are and it, you know can make a lot of mistakes showing them that right with actual tangible examples i think that's a really helpful way to move forward and I think, you know, just encouraging innovation on a, a faculty and administrator side, like let's have teachers, you know, create GPTs for their classes and see how that works, right? Rather than doing a large scale deployment, let's have these teachers play around, see what works, see what doesn't. And then it's up to their discretion to figure out if it's not beneficial to their classroom. But at the same time, students, you know, may have differing opinions on that. They may be like, my teacher doesn't want me to use AI, but I have tangible strategies such as studying with AI that have helped me. So I think it is, you know, and, and that point brings up that it's a conversation between students and teachers and yeah, administrators totally. that we all need to have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have, we've come to the end. I've got about 18 more questions to ask you. So we'll definitely bring you back in February or March if you're free. Um, a huge mahalo for, for joining us. Nicholas, where can people find you? How can they, you know, hear about your work, connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. LinkedIn's uh, uh, my, you know, the best place to connect with me. I also have an email, um, which is also on my LinkedIn profile. So would we'll anyone who's you know doing this work as well um, would love to connect and, and learn about the work you're doing. So yeah, thank you so much for you know the audience for being here. A huge mahalo. Please subscribe, and we're super grateful 